Father, your, your mercy is certainly infinite and your loving kindness is everlasting. Your perfections are infinite, every last one of them. And we praise you for your mercy, we praise you for your love, we praise you for your faithfulness. We can also praise you for your justice, we can praise you for your righteous, righteousness, your righteous decrees and your righteous judgments. And we can praise you for your wrath. We can praise you that you are so perfect in your being that your response to everything that happens in your creation is always perfect all of the time. We can praise you that you are omniscient and omnipotent. And we can praise you that nothing ever catches you by surprise. We can praise you that you hate wickedness and you never let guilt go unpunished. But at the same time, you are the God who forgives iniquity, sin, and transgression. You are the God who sees all and knows all and will never let guilt go unpunished and you will always bring appropriate recompense to the sinner, but you can sovereignly determine even to use willing agents to accomplish your redemptive purposes. And so, Lord, when we sing that your mercy is more and when we praise you for your mercy and your compassion, um, we also acknowledge, we, cr- we can praise you for every single attribute that you per- per- uh, possess with perfection. And so, Lord, we just we pause this morning, even as we pray this and as we think about who you are and as we pause to worship you, simply noting who you are, whom we are praying to, as, as Denny has already encouraged us from Hebrews 4. We, we come to you, to your throne room, and we, we cannot do this so quickly or abruptly without pausing to realize that you are the perfect God with all balance and all perfection. And it's very appropriate to do that this morning and to pause and to acknowledge that, Lord, we, we need to consider you in all of your perfections. And we pray that you would help us to view you rightly, to hold these perfections in balance, and to never be imbalanced in our own view of you. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd answer this prayer even as we open up your word this morning. Give us balance as we seek to know you in your word and so that we can see your perfections on display. Glorify yourself, glorify your son, and minister to us as we look at Mark chapter 1. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, you can take a seat, and I want to invite you to grab your Bibles and open up to Mark chapter 1, and Lord willing, we will finish this chapter, Mark chapter 1, this morning. It's the last story in Mark 1, and it's in quite a story indeed. As you're turning to Mark 1, I just want to mention, you could hear, even in my prayer, you could hear the perfections of God that I, I've been thinking about and contemplating, and it's just incredible to think about the perfections of God, that sometimes God's perfections, His attributes, can seem quite contradictory. They can seem antithetical. They can almost seem opposed to one another, and yet all of God's perfections are constantly at play um, perfectly. There's a tension and maybe even a, a seeming, seemingly like a contradiction in God's own perfections when you look at the fact that God is transcendent and yet he is imminent. And you can see the collision of that reality in passages in Scripture. You know, I was just thinking about the uh, passage in, in Jeremiah where Jeremiah, is, as a prophet, is rebuking the nation and the, the thoughts of the nation are, it, uh, they're, they're questioning whether God is really far enough above the universe to actually judge what's happening in their own ministries. And, and Jeremiah has to rebuke them and say, is he not a God who is far off and not just a God who is near? Is it one versus the other? Is God only transcendent? Or is he only imminent? He's a God of love and wrath, held in perfect balance. 
There's no imbalance with God. He's, he's not sitting there juggling, uh, oh, how do I juggle these perfections? When do I mute one and when do I mute the other? When do I crank up the volume on one and crank up the volume on the other? He's just, he is those things all the time with perfect balance. That's what it means to be God. As we just heard from Pastor Smed in Equipping Hour, he's just and he is forgiving. And the tensions of Proverbs 17, 15 is the very tension of the gospel. And God is both. God is righteous and, and, and he always judges iniquity, but at the same time he can seemingly use willful, wicked men to accomplish good and holy purposes. And it's just mind-boggling. And in fact, that happens throughout the history of, of God's people in the Old Testament. That happens several times. You can read Isaiah chapter 10 about Assyria, and God raises up Assyria. And Assyria is a, a pagan nation that loves themselves and takes pride in their own military power. And God actually raises them up. He even exalts Assyria to bring judgment on his own people. And that starts to cause all sorts of uh, response from the nation, like, are you kidding me, God? Or, what, whatever happened to your faithfulness? Whatever happened to your righteousness? What happened to you, these perfections? The same thing happened, you fast forward to another generation, a, a century later, Habakkuk chapter 1, when it's not the Assyrians, then it's the Chaldeans. And God says, I'm going to show you something that you wouldn't believe even if it were told you. And you, you start wetting your chops, oh, wow, what's this going to be? It's going to be amazing. He says, well, I'm bringing the Chaldeans against you. What? And the nation hears that and thinks, God, can you really do that? Don't you know who that is? That's going to go to their head. They're a wicked nation. Yeah, I'm going to bring them and I'm actually going to purify my people. I'm going to judge the nation with the Chaldeans. What? These perfections are always in perfect balance with our God. And we start to try to interpret God through the lens of our favored pet perfections and our favorite pet attributes and our view of God gets awful small, awful quick. That is the epitome of idolatry. Psalm 50 verse 21 says, you thought I was altogether just like you. And we start creating God after our own image, after our own desires, and we start, we start taking the controls of the attributes of God and we turn up the dimmer switch and turn down the dimmer switch on the attributes we want and our God gets incredibly small, namely he becomes a man-made God who is not the God of the scriptures anymore. God possesses all of his attributes with perfection in perfect balance. He is unimprovable in his essence, unimprovable in his character. That's why there's no change with God. If there was a change with God, he would become less because he is perfect. The same can be said of Christ. Christ's attributes are held in perfect balance. And we're about to read a narrative where Christ responds to one man with two radically, seemingly contradictory, and I'll call them antithetical responses. The same man receives antithetical responses from Jesus Christ in the same story. And this, this narrative, this story is going to keep us honest this morning. It's going to keep us honest. Because uh, we certainly could read this and we could pick our favorite doctrine and we could start to get Christ wrong and out of balance. But both are true. I've titled this Christ's Compassion and Censure. We're going to see Christ's softness and his scolding in the very same story. Mark chapter 1, verse 40 to 45. Mark records... And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him. And he said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he sternly warned him, and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, See to it that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, 
and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in unpopulated areas. And they were coming to him from everywhere. This leper shows up in a kind of a transitional point in Mark's story. We've already seen Mark document that Jesus is teaching, his ministry is uh, filled with a teaching that is both authoritative and it's his priority. He's focused on his teaching ministry. That's, that's what he came to accomplish. And this is laying a groundwork for the nature of the rejection that Mark is about to document. And we're going to get to that by the end here because this is important to keep this story where it sits in Mark's gospel. Because remember, Mark is not primarily organizing these stories chronologically. He's primarily organizing them thematically. And so he has a point to why he's doing what he's doing and where he puts these stories, why he puts them where he puts them, and how he tells them the way he tells them. And this is a profound story that is coming on the tail end of, of Mark documenting the nature of Jesus, his ministry, his teaching, and what his message really was, and he begins to show us in increasing fashion, increasing loudness, the hostility against Jesus' own ministry. And let me just briefly go, give a, get a fast forward here to give us some, some um, awareness of our context. Let's, let's look ahead for a second. This is where we're going. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. This is a story where Jesus is Again, doing what he came to do. He is speaking the word. He's preaching um, his own word to the people who need to hear the truth. And it gets interrupted with some curiosity seekers who want their, their friend to be healed. And it turns into a healing. And then he pronounces his sins forgiven. And the hostility comes from the leaders. And they are reasoning within themselves, verse 8. The hostility from the leadership of the nation is very subtle. It's actually unspoken. It's inaudible. It's entirely internal. And yet it's still there in seed form. In the next story, verses 13 through 17, it becomes verbal. It becomes audible and it's actually expressed. But not to Jesus. It's not that bold yet. It's actually just to his disciples. So the formerly silent criticisms of Christ have now become articulated to the disciples in verses 18 to 22, now they start to go directly at Jesus, and they don't bring direct accusations or contradictions. They just start to bring open questions, and they start questioning Jesus directly in verses 18 to 22. In verse 23 to 20, 28, now they finally start flat out contradicting Jesus, confronting him for his sin, and the hostility is absolutely overt. By the time you get to chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, it becomes full-blown attack where they are going underground, coming up with a plan, hatching a plot to kill Jesus. So from chapter 2, verse 1, all the way through chapter 3, verse 6, this hostility of this, this negative response to Jesus' ministry is just getting highlighted in increasing fashion. And so we're about to launch into full-blown documentary of what the leadership do in response to this message. You remember where we've come from, though. We've already seen a response to Jesus' authoritative preaching. The demons do whatever he tells them to do. And they recognize his identity. They're sitting there running around. He, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus is busy silencing them because he doesn't want the bad publicity because the bad publicity is making his teaching ministry more difficult. The people, unlike the demons, are still, to this point, undocumented as to submission to the authoritative teaching of Jesus Christ. They are absolutely impressed. They know that his miracles are legitimate. There's no questioning that. And they're actually quite intrigued by the newness of his teaching, which was unlike anything they'd ever heard before. But when it comes to submission to his word, we still have not yet seen that. And here comes this leper. This leper comes up to Jesus. He's beseeching him. He's falling on his knees. 
And he starts to cry out, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And so he recognizes Jesus has ability. He recognizes that Jesus is a healer. He knows that Jesus' miracles are legitimate. He does not question that. He does not doubt that. And so he appeals to his willingness. And this story really, it, it, it kind of ends the summary of Jesus' teaching ministry in Galilee and transition us, transition us toward the rejection of the Jewish leadership and the unbelief of the Jewish leadership. And so as we work through chapters 1 through 8, Mark's going to work systematic, systematically through people group after people group after people group documenting unbelief, namely the leaders, 1 through 3, the people of the nation, 3 through 6, and then even the disciples, 6 through 8. And so here comes this leper. How's he going to respond to Jesus? Looks pretty good in verse 40. He's not questioning his ability. He's not questioning his healings. He's not questioning his ministry. He's coming to him for help. And Christ's response to him comes in really stark contrast. I mean, if you read verses 41 and 42, you get one sense. And if you read 43 to 45, you get quite the opposite sense. And both are true. Is Jesus compassionate toward this individual? <laughs> or is he agitated at this individual? Yes. Let's look at him one at a time. Verse 41, moved with compassion. Moved with compassion. Jesus is moved with compassion. He has pity. There is a, a reflex in his soul of perfect compassion to the plight of this man. This man is struggling with leprosy. And you don't struggle with leprosy. It's not something that you kind of, you know, you do okay with and it kind of ebbs and flows and, oh, okay, well, the antibiotics are working this week and, oh, okay. No, you just, you, you have it. It's just, you're stuck with it. And so, this is probably Hansen's disease, the proper, the proper uh, leprous um, disease that is, um, starts to uh, ruin your, your nerves, ability to sense pain and sensitivity, and so it starts, it's a neurological disease, and so the decay and the, 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 the damage done to the body is because you can no longer feel anymore. And so if you've seen uh, pictures of um, leprosy, it looks like the disease is actually eating your extremities, but it's actually uh, the lack of sensitivity and the use of the extremities ends up ruining those sensitivities. And so this man is suffering from that. There is no cure for this disease in those days. In fact, it's important to even, you know, put it in perspective because it's easy for us to talk about leprosy and be like, yeah, yeah, leprosy, we, we've heard about it. And, and yeah, in third world countries, there's, people still suffer from it today. It's, it's still around. But there are modern day cures. So if you go back to when there was no cure, the response to leprosy is quite different. Let me give you an example. Look at 2 Kings for a moment. 2 Kings chapter 5, and this is the story of Naaman and uh, the, the general of um, the Aramean army, and he is sent to Israel because they hear that there is a prophet there. And so 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 introduces us to Naaman, he's the captain of the army, so he's like the general, picture him as the, the commanding officer, the, the general of the entire military. And so, um, skip down to verse uh, 4, Naaman goes in to, his, to the king, and he basically tells him, look, there's this girl who I know who's from the land of Israel, and, and she, has, she knows there's this prophet. So the king, in verse 5, gives him a letter, and writes this letter to the king of Israel, and sends it with um, Naaman, and uh, he departs, he takes with him, verse 5b, ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothes. Verse 6, he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may cure him of leprosy. That's all he's asking, just to cure him of leprosy. There is no cure. And notice the response. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God 
to kill and to make alive? That this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But consider now and see how he is seeking a quarrel against me. So he's sitting there and he's saying, look, obviously this is ridiculous. Curing of leprosy in those days is a, basically the equivalent of us saying curing death. I mean, it's just, there's no cure. We have no medical cure for leprosy. He's just trying to pick a fight. Obviously, this is some sort of military ploy. That's all that's happening here. And he just, that's, how he, that's how he interprets the letter. In verse 8, it happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes. Um, he sent word to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. And so to cure, to cure leprosy is obviously viewed as some sort of divine reality, some sort of divine reality because it would require a prophet truly sent from God to have that kind of power to do something like curing leprosy. Other than a prophet sent from God, nobody can cure that. And so the prophet here says, yep, send him to me. That'll be my credentials. You realize this leper... He sees in Jesus the only one who can solve his leprosy. He knows that Jesus is the only one who can cure him. And he goes to Jesus on his knees, beseeching him. He has no hope apart from Christ for his leprosy. There is no cure for his leprosy apart from Christ. The only question he asks is, are you willing? Jesus is moved with compassion at this request because he sees his plight. He sees his helplessness. This is a man in need. This is a man suffering under the curse. This is a man who is suffering affliction. If Adam had never sinned, there would be no leprosy. This man would not be suffering. He is suffering the effects of the curse. And you put that kind of need in front of Jesus of Nazareth, who is the seed who came to reverse the curse, his response, his natural response, his DNA response, it's in his bloodstream, is to reverse that curse, to meet that need, to alleviate the pain and the suffering. And so he's moved with compassion. I want to pause for a second. In verse 41, when it says that Jesus was moved with compassion, because we have to say it that way, moved with compassion, because we don't really have a verb for compassion, but this is a verb for compassion. And so the Greek ear would hear something like Jesus compassionizing. <laughs> so let's create a verb. Compassionizing. He, he, he compassionized the leper. He experienced compassion. He felt compassion. He, he had compassion. He was compassionate. He, he compassionized. This is just uh, an interesting word. It's, it's, a, it's a used 15 times in the um, Greek New Testament, and, and it's all used of, of Christ. Let me, let me just, at, at the risk of, I don't think we're going to bore anyone this morning, at the risk of blowing you away, at seeing the compassion of our Lord. Let's look at some of these examples. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 records an instance where Jesus expresses compassion. In verse 36, 936, seeing the people, and this is right on the heels of, remember verse 35. Actually, let's go back to verse 35. That's important for this, for this occurrence. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. So there you go. It's just a kind of a Mark in parallel to where we're at in, I mean, a, a Matthew parallel to Mark 1. Uh, Jesus was doing his ministry, and of course he's preaching, and of course he's healing and casting out demons. And so then as he said to his disciples, I'm sorry, verse 36, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. They are, they're tossed about to and fro. 
They're succumbing to every idea of false religion imposed on them by the religious establishment. They can't even discern the thoughts that they have about God coming from within, from ones that are true versus ones they've learned from the Bible, because they haven't learned the Word of God. They are sheep without a shepherd, and the answer is they need truth. And Christ is so compassionate that he says, here are sheep without a shepherd, they need truth. He sees man in his need, whether it's spiritual or physical, he wants to meet that need. And so here are people without truth, and he says, we need to give them truth. Give them the truth. Look at Matthew chapter 14, verse 14. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them. He compassionized the crowd. (laughs) And he healed their sick. He sees the sickness. He sees the disease. It doesn't matter if they're lacking healing, if they're suffering under the curse, or if they're needing answers from the truth. He is motivated by compassion. Next chapter, chapter 15, verse 32 Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me three days now and they have nothing to eat. I don't want them to go away hungry for they might faint on, their, on the way. Think about this manifestation of compassion. Christ is so compassionate when he sees sheep without a shepherd, he's going to give them truth. And in this case, he's actually giving them three days worth. And his compassion doesn't end there at spiritual truth. His compassion is, but man, they're not even going to make it home because they're famished. And so he proceeds to feed them so they can get home, take the truth with them, and they're physically provided for and they're spiritually provided for. Chapter 18, Matthew 18, verse 27. Here is the story, the famous story that Jesus created. You could call it a parable. It's just really kind of an analogy. It's a a, a word picture, if you will. And in Matthew chapter 18, verse 27, there's the story of the, um, the, the Lord who is the one who has the debt against him, and the slave is the one who owes the debt. And he comes to the, to the Lord, to the ruler, and basically says, will, will you forgive this debt? And so the Lord says, he, or Jesus says, that the Lord in the story felt compassion and released him and forgave the debt. He was motivated by compassion because he saw that this man had no ability to meet the debt, to meet the need. It was beyond his ability, and so he's moved with compassion for this individual. In chapter 20, verse 34, We are jumping into a healing of uh, two blind men. And we're going to see a parallel of this in Mark chapter 10. They call out to him, and they actually say in verse 31, Have mercy on us, be compassionate toward us, show pity to us. In other words, we are needy and we have no way to meet this need. You alone can meet this need. And they're looking to him. They are completely dependent on him. And of course, That strikes a chord with Christ because Christ is compassionate and merciful. And so in verse 31, uh, 32, Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Verse 33, we want our eyes to be opened. And so verse 34, moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. He has compassion because they are blind. And that's just in Jesus' DNA. He came to restore sight to the blind, both physically and spiritually. And so here he is reversing the curse, and the cords of his heart, or more literal to the Greek language, the cords of his bowels, (laughs) because the word to to show compassion is really the verb form of the noun for bowels. And it's the the guts, it's the innards being turned toward toward pity and compassion, because you see someone's need. You see that they have no hope, there are no answers, there's no solution And so pity kicks in, and you say, I want to help. That's the heart of Jesus. I showed you the examples in Matthew, and we could continue. There's four more examples in Mark, which we'll have time to look at, and then there's three more examples in Luke. Several of those are 
parallels. One of them, though, is not. I'll just mention it to you. Luke chapter 7 has no parallel. He shows up at a funeral, and it's an adult man, but it's a woman's only son, and Jesus is moved with compassion at this funeral. And what's in Jesus' DNA except to reverse the curse? And so he raises that man from the dead because he's motivated by compassion toward this woman who lost her only son. That's the heart of our Lord. That's the heart of Christ. So back to Mark chapter 1, back to our story. Jesus is moved with compassion. He is motivated by compassion. He is compassionizing this leper. And at that point, Mark says, he stretched out his hand and touched him. And man, if you want some entertaining reading, just read commentators on that phrase. It is so ironic. I don't know how many commentators I read. Oh, I mean, this is Jesus just kind of, you know, throwing caution to the wind and just totally disregarding Old Testament law about touching a leper. Well, Jesus was at the proper time born of a woman, born under the law, and he fulfilled the law perfectly. So if he actually violated the law, then we have no answer, we have no solution, we have no salvation. We have no righteousness in Christ if he violated the Old Testament law. He did not violate the law. I don't know what the commentators, they, they're missing the point. Jesus did not violate the law to touch this man. The point is that Jesus, by definition, did not become unclean because the moment he touched him, he was no longer a leper. He's not ceremonially unclean. It would be impossible that he could be. So he's motivated by compassion. He reaches down and touches him. The man is clean, cleansed. He actually answers his question in verse 41 and says, I am willing, lest you wonder whether I'm moved upon by compassion you better believe I'm moved upon by compassion. There's pity for this man's plight. He is stuck in his leprosy. He has no way out. There is no cure. And he sees he can, he's going to succumb to this disease and he will die from it. And he is more than willing to cleanse him. Verse 42, Mark explains it, and he personifies leprosy. It gives leprosy the qualities of a person, and it just says immediately the leprosy left him. And so it just pictures the whole disease as having a will and volition, saying, I'm out of here, it's gone. And here's this man, formerly a leper, now healed. He was cleansed. The leprosy's gone. Just like what happened to the man in the synagogue, the demon is gone. Just like Simon Peter's mother-in-law, the fever was gone. Just like the entire village of Capernaum, demonic activity and demon possession, the disease, it has just eradicated. And in the surrounding area, disease and demon possession being eradicated from all Galilee and the northern portion of Israel. It's just gone, and so it's no different with this man. And by the way, if you started reading through the Gospels and tried to think, okay, I guess, why did Mark record this story? Well, because he healed a leper. Well, no. There were a thousand lepers. There were untold lepers that Jesus cleansed and healed, and they don't even tell the story. In fact, when Jesus goes to Simon's house, uh, it says that Simon was a leper, and we don't have any record of how he was healed. I mean, certainly Jesus healed him because he was formerly a leper. Now everybody's showing up at his house for a meal, so he's obviously ceremonially clean, but it doesn't record that story. This story is put here for a reason, and it's put here for a purpose, because there's more to this story than would meet the eye from just looking at verse 40 to 42. Jesus is compassionate. He's moved by compassion, because that's his heart. He loves to help the needy. He sees the helpless, and he's going to step in and, and meet that need. He, he is so compassionate, he wants to alleviate human suffering. He did not create this world to be a world full of suffering. 
He created it to be inhabited by men created in his own image. He is the image of God. We are created in his image. And he created it to have fellowship with us so that we would worship him forever. And so here, he's restoring that curse that came ever since Adam, and he's motivated by compassion to do it. If the story ended at verse 42, you'd say, great, man, this guy benefited, and that's awesome. But there's more to the story. I call this Christ's compassion and his censure. Why censure? Because in verse 43, there's really an abrupt transition. I mean, this is, it's an, it's an abrupt um, transition because emotionally you go from Jesus being compassionate, motivated by his compassion, to see Jesus being motivated by something else entirely. Now, the word here is translated, he sternly warned him. And it just kind of comes out of the out of a clear blue sky like a lightning bolt. You think there, there was no storm cloud on the horizon. Where in the world did that come from? And in Mark, you know, if we, we obviously have read the whole story, so you know where this is going. It's going to a rebuke to tell this man what he needs to do, and the man completely blows off Jesus' exhortation. He doesn't do anything that Jesus says. He diso- disobeys him entirely. And you can fast forward to verse 45. At the very end, the very last phrase of this uh, story is just a a background comment and just explaining people are coming to Jesus from everywhere. This increased his publicity and his popularity so profoundly that he can no longer preach in inhabited areas anymore. I mean, this single act of disobedience uh, made Jesus' preaching ministry exponentially more difficult to navigate. If it wasn't for the fact that Jesus was perfect, you might think, okay, he knows what this guy's up to, he's going to make his preaching ministry more difficult, and he's just annoyed at the guy. No, he's not just annoyed at the guy. I mean, he puts up with the disciples for the next 16 chapters. (laughs) He is not just annoyed at this guy. This is not sinful annoyance. But there there is an agitation here, and I would even say that it's so strong as to say there is an indignation here. There is a righteous indignation in this rebuke coming from Jesus. And let me just, let me just explain to you kind of what's going on here with this word. Uh, I'm just going to read to you a summary because this, this uh, one, one writer really nailed it. And he said this, this is D. Edmund Hebert, he said, Mark's term, again, that's the phrase translated sternly warned. D. Edmund Hebert on that word says, Mark's term, stronger than that used by the other synoptics, denotes strong emotion and makes a swift change from tender pity to stern command. The verb usually indicates indignant displeasure, and it might signify deep emotion expressed in tone and manner. An element of real displeasure seems implied here. Jesus feared that the man would be too demonstrative in his gratitude, thus arousing a veritable hurricane of unwanted popularity for Jesus as a miracle worker. Jesus sought to keep the man from doing what he later did do. And that's exactly right. This word is a a word that is used in classical Greek literature of horses snorting and stamping and just, you know, getting all fired up and agitated. Um, It it can be used of even groaning. It can be used, uh, here's the textbook definition, as an expression of anger and displeasure with a person or toward a person. It can be translated scold or censure. And um, why, why censure? Because censure is a word that the textbook definition really means it's an act of blaming or condemning sternly. And, and there, is a, there is an element of, of anger here, not sinful anger, but righteous indignation. Righteous indignation at this man's unbelief. Unbelief? Yeah. Unbelief. We should not be surprised by this. John 2 tells us Jesus knew what was in a man, and so therefore he does not entrust himself to men. And that's in a context. If you want to go back and read John 2, verse 23 to 25, it's in a context where John says people believed Jesus, but he doesn't entrust themselves to him. Why? If they believe him, why wouldn't he entrust himself to them? Because they believed he was who he said he was, But they did not entrust themselves to him as Lord and Savior. It was an intellectual, it was an ascent, it was an intellectual conversion. 
but it was not saving faith. And Jesus knew in their heart that it was not saving faith. And so he does not entrust himself to them the way that he does to all of his children. And so here is a powerful story where Jesus is powerfully motivated by compassion toward this individual and powerfully motivated by righteous indignation toward this man's unbelief. And so he sternly warns him. Let me, let me show you a couple more examples of this. Go back to Matthew 9 real quick, because here's a really good parallel. It's not the same story. It's a different story. But it's, 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 a, it's a very parallel type of story. So we saw this. Uh, in, go back to Matthew 9, verse um, 30. He's healing um, two, two different blind men that we just read from Matthew 20. These two blind men are also crying out for deliverance because they know that Jesus can heal blindness. And so they say, have mercy on us, son of David. Verse 28, Jesus says, do you believe that I'm able to do this? They say, yes, Lord. He touches their eyes, saying, it shall be done to you according to your faith. They even have faith that Jesus has the ability to heal. And then he opens their, their, their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warns them saying, see to it that no one knows about this, verse 31, but they went out and spread the news uh, about him throughout all that land. They had faith in what? That Jesus has the ability and the compassion to meet my self-loving desires. I want to be healed. And Jesus healed them and turned right around and with indignation and righteousness, warned them, watch out that you don't turn this into publicity if you're interested in the purposes of my Father and the gospel. And they said, yeah, right. Hey, everyone, check out what happened to us. That's powerful. That's powerful. This, this word is um, used of Jesus Two times where he healed somebody who walks away and totally disregards his word. Matthew 9 and now Mark 1. It's used a third time of the disciples in Mark chapter 14. We're going to read about Mary who is scolded with hostility, with agitation by the disciples because of the amount of the lavish gift that she poured out on Jesus when she anointed him. And they scolded her. The only other time it's used of Jesus is in John chapter 11, where his heart is stirred up with agitation. It's just stirred up. It's unsettled because Lazarus died. Here you have Jesus, the Son of God, coming to earth, the earth that he created, and now it's under the curse, and he's watching the effect of the curse, and he's watching it affect the people that he loves and he sees Lazarus die, and death is, of course, unnatural. It entered into the world through Adam's sin, a foreign reality to the way God originally designed the universe. And here is the Son of God seeing death have its toll on a true friend, and he is indignant. His heart is stirred. There's agitation. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled, John eleven thirty three 33 says. For 1138, Jesus again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb, and he proceeds to raise Lazarus from the dead. This word is a word that quite often has intensity, agitation, indignation, and certainly I would say that in the first three examples, two of Jesus after healing somebody who's going to totally disregard his word, and the third one of the disciples who are frustrated at Mary for such a lavish gift, in those three instances, it undoubtedly has the connotation of anger, a righteous indignation for Christ, and a sinful anger for the disciples. This shouldn't surprise us. Listen, Christians, it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus' scolding or his righteous indignation should rise up in the face of unbelief any any more than it should surprise us that his compassion should rise up in the face of suffering the effects of the curse. They're both perfectly natural to Christ. We can't raise one over the other. Here they are in perfect balance, 
in perfect harmony and both landing on or directed towards the same individual. Let's pick up the story, verse 43. He sternly warns him, and he immediately sends him away. He says, look, you need to get out of here. And what's he telling him to do, verse 40? This is the the charge that he gives him. See to it that you say nothing to anyone. So in other words, here's your command. Here are your marching orders. Zippo. (laughs) Silence. Be quiet about this. All you're going to do about this is in 44b, go, show yourself to the priest, offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. The to them is undoubtedly, it's it's obviously plural grammatically, and undoubtedly in light of where Mark goes in his gospel for the next six stories documenting the unbelief of the religious leaders, it's show this as a testimony to the religious establishment. Show yourself to the priests and the scribes, the leaders in Jerusalem, who would have to recognize and weigh in, give verdict that you are ceremonially clean, and then actually offer your sacrifices in Jerusalem. And that's going to be a testimony to them. The sacrifices pertaining to cleansing from leprosy are recorded in Leviticus chapter 14. Uh, For the sake of time, I won't read them, but you can go back and read those. In verses 1 through 20 is one account, and then in verses 21 to 32 is a separate account. Why two accounts? Because it depends on uh, what you can afford. So there's two different kind of, it's like, uh, you know, option A, option B, depending on your financial status. It's like, here is the offering, and this is the process. When you read that chapter, Leviticus 14, you find out that the ceremonial cleansing process would have taken eight days. On the eighth day, after being recognized as clean, after the sacrifice has been offered, then they come back and it's verified a second time, and then you would be pronounced ceremonially clean. It's an eight-day process. That does not include the amount of travel time that it would take to get from the Sea of Galilee down to Jerusalem on foot. And that does not account for what became common in Jesus' day, and this, at this time it would be common that the man would first show himself to a priest in his local area, and that priest could weigh in and say, yep, yeah, you're clean, because then that would actually allow you to even go to Jerusalem and get into the temple and be seen by priests. And so he would have to go to his local priest, get some sort of approval, and then go to Jerusalem, and then start the process of the eight-day cleansing, and then get back to start blabbing. None of that appears to have happened. This is a fast-paced story. He uh, uses immediately in 42, he uses immediately in 43, and Jesus tells him what he wants him to do immediately after sending him out, and it just simply transitions into contrast of this man doing the exact opposite. Verse 45, but he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but he stayed out in unpopulated areas. And so he had to be away from the crowds, away from the sheep who needed to hear the truth. They were sheep without a shepherd. They were the people of Israel in unbelief. People without a shepherd needing the gospel, needing Christ's message, and he can't even get to them because of the bad publicity and the bad press. That's the effects of this man's unbelief. And Jesus, I'm certain, knew what was in his heart, John 2 23 to 25 tells us he does. And here he warns him with a righteous indignation and with disapproval from verse 43. And 45 proves that Jesus' indignation was indeed righteous. I already mentioned to you it's important to appreciate this story. It's, to, to appreciate this story, I should say, it's, it's important to read it in its context. What's Mark doing here? What's the work? that this story is accomplishing. As a reader, we're, 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 we step back and we're just impressed at our Lord and we look at Jesus Christ and we're like, wow. I mean, softness, scolding in perfect harmony, compassion and censure. There's a pity, there's an indignation in the exact same story toward the same person in perfect harmony. And you just look at the perfections of Christ on display and you, you, what, what's the take-home for us as readers of Mark? Well, Mark is, as I mentioned, he's already documenting, he's moving towards the documentation of the unbelief of the leaders and then the people and even the disciples. You say, man, what, what, 
You keep talking about this unbelief, and that's the refrain. Jesus is, chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus is moved with anger, and he's grieved at their hardness of heart, and he heals a man anyway, in spite of it being on the Sabbath, against their own tradition. And so the leaders plan to kill him. Chapter 6, verse 6, Jesus marvels. He's blown away. They've been blown away at his miracles. He's blown away at their unbelief. Quite ironic. And then Mark chapter 8, verse 17, he's asking the disciples, do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Verse 21, do you not yet understand? He's asking them, are you putting it together? Are you, are you going to accept my identity? Are you going to accept my message? Are you going to receive what I'm saying? The leaders haven't. The people haven't. But if you read Mark 1 superficially, you'd say, man, this is, he's having quite a start. Early phases of Jesus' ministry, his popularity couldn't be better. And Mark is sitting there saying, yeah, his popularity is through the roof. But the response to his authority with submission? How many humans so far? Zero. The benefit for us, we've got to keep Christ's attributes and God's attributes in perfect balance. And when we don't, really, really bad things happen. We start to become, our view of God gets awful small, and we start to actually harm ourselves. This is interesting. This man is clearly in this story in unbelief. He totally disregards Jesus' words. He doesn't submit to Jesus at all. And he has a faith of sorts, like a Mark 9 type of faith. He believes that Jesus can heal him. And like the popularity-seeking, curiosity-seeking, self-loving crowds all around Capernaum, this man wants to be healed. He wants a better life. He knows Jesus can give it to him. And of course, when Christ comes back, he's going to give that to a lost and dying world, and he's going to establish a reign of righteousness. And self-loving people will love the reign of Christ for the effects that they get without loving Christ. There will still be unbelievers in the kingdom. This is a profound display of, of unbelief. And if we started to read this story and we started to accentuate Christ's compassion and we forgot about his censure, that's kind of the typical way we tend to do things, we get, we get into some serious problems. Uh, this morning, we already heard it from, from Pastor Smed. We heard there, is it, your, your Bible gets turned upside down if you start reading through a particular lens. He was talking about particularly reading it through a salvation-centered lens, as if everything in Scripture is about salvation. Well, if you read it through a salvation-centered lens, you can't make sense of quite a bit of your Bible. Same thing happens here. We start thinking about our relationship with Christ, and we read it through a compassion-centered lens. And suddenly, we start believing that we benefit from Christ's compassion because he is compassion. He's infinitely compassionate. You can't, you can't overplay Christ's compassion. But you certainly can underplay his censure. You certainly can underplay his righteous indignation. And in this case, imagine if you heard the popular message today. Oh, no, no, the, the, the Christ is so compassionate. He, he, he loves you where you're at. He loves you where you're at, and his compassion's going to just come in and overtake all of those concerns, all of your burdens. And, and maybe you're a Christian who, maybe you're, you're really worried that Christ isn't going to be compassionate because, because you, you just have really, you know, you, 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 keep, you keep blowing him off and you keep failing to submit to his word and, 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 and it really gets tiring to keep thinking about obedience and just remember he's compassionate. Well, you do realize that everything I just said also describes this man. He was weary of obedience. He was tired of submitting. He was exhausted. He was probably worried that, I wonder what Jesus thinks of me, because he told me to not tell anyone, and I just went and blabbed it to everybody. Don't worry, friend, Christ is compassionate. He is. But he also has righteous indignation. And this is an important lesson to learn from the book of Mark we dare not confuse 
our self-loving desire for Christ's help with saving faith. The church in this country is making a name for itself on that lie. We are selling a gospel to a lost and dying world. Christ is compassionate and wants to make your life better. And curiosity seekers and self-loving individuals are coming to a Christ to find those needs met. And of course, Christ legitimately does meet those needs. I mean, imagine if Christ were the president of the U.S., imagine what would happen to the economics, imagine what would happen to the justice system, imagine what would happen to the medical uh, system. Imagine Christ as dictator over the world. You better believe that's going to be better for everyone. And people will be under that dictatorship. The awesome, righteous, kind, good, loving dictatorship of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they will not all bow the knee. Do not confuse self-loving desire with self-denying submission. This man wanted to be healed, and he came to Christ, and he received compassion. And he totally blew off his word, and he was still in his sin. This becomes a warning for us, a protection for us personally. It becomes an instruction for us in our discipleship. It becomes instruction for us in our evangelism. But this is a story that we need to meditate on and benefit from, lest we confuse these two attributes, or accentuate one over the other. Lord, thank you so much for this short story, which is so powerful. God, it, it shows us the perfections of your Son in such a profound contrast. They, they're seemingly antithetical, but obviously they are not contradictory. And uh, we worship your Son, we worship you, because your perfections exist in perfect harmony. I want to just pray for us as your children, that we would not confuse your compassion with approval. I pray that we would not confuse a desire to benefit from your compassion with a willingness to deny ourselves and submit to you as Lord. Lord, your word is authoritative. And we know that our flesh grates against submission. We know that you are compassionate and you are going to reverse the curse. And our flesh loves the thought of you reversing the curse on our behalf. Lord, don't ever let us confuse those two desires because they are opposite. And I pray, Lord, that we would cherish the thought of denying ourselves in order to be faithful to you and that we would preach a gospel to a world that, like this leper, longs for the benefits of Christ, but refuses to bow the knee to your word. And so I pray, Lord, that you would cultivate within us the discernment to recognize the difference between the two, because I know my own heart, and it is subtle, and it is deceitful. But your word exposes the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And Lord, even this powerful story that showcases the glory of your Son in a very unique way, it has the power to open the heart this morning. For anyone here who is, is confused and has perhaps thought that their relationship with you was rooted in compassion because perhaps they are weary of obedience and perhaps they are seeing perpetual failure and perhaps they are confusing their current experience of never seeing power over sin or never seeing their heart yield, never actually denying themselves for the sake of, of bowing their knee to you in, in their heart. Maybe they're only bowing their knee like this leper for the external gain or for the physical benefit. I pray, Lord, that this word, this story, the glory of your son would stop them dead in their tracks and show them their need to submit to your authoritative word. In your name we pray. Amen.